Thank you very much and thanks a lot to the organizers for the invitation. So I will talk about joint work with Sunil Chita and Vincent Befara. So some of you have heard me talk about this in ways before and probably Sunil and Vincent also. So I, I thought I had an expert audience today. So I will go a little more into the details. I mean, not really the details, but be a little more, not just give the background. So you all know the model, I think. So we're looking at the so-called Aztec diamond. So this is this kind of shape that you see here, and we cover it by dominoes, right? We can also think of this as a dimer model instead. So on, on, on the squares that you sort of have like this, you put vertices and you connect these neighboring vertices with, with in pairs like this, with dimers and sitting on top like this. And, you, and dimers don't intersect just like these dominoes don't cover each other. So you can see there's a direct correspondence between these pictures. So we'll take mostly sort of the dimer point of view later on. So we want to make this into a probability. So here you see the graph that you have for the dimer model. So a dimer would be covering a white and a black vertex here. So it's a bipartite graph. And you cannot cover sort of a vertex more than once. So it's a, pair, a, a perfect matching between black and white vertices. So you put weights, and the way you put weights in this so-called so two-periodic Aztec diamond is that you have these weights 1 and a. So all the edges around this a square here have weight a. And all the edges around this square here have weight 1. And you see in this way, every edge now will have a weight either a or 1. And they, they alternate like you see in the picture here. So if I put a equal to 1, I would just get the standard uniform Aztec diamond. So picking all at uniform, because the weight that you take for a certain dimer cover here is that you take the product of the weights where you have the dimers, right? And then you normalize this. So if A is one, all, all of them would have the same weight. But if you take A different from one, then of course, depending on how they cover, you will get different weights for different dimer covers here. So this is the model. And a simulation of this looks something like this. This is, I think, for a equal to a half. So you see you get a rather definite pattern here. So you, you can see quite immediately that you have sort of three types of regions here. So the, in the middle you have a sort of, which looks rather disorder. This I will call the ga a gas type of region. I will come back to this terminology a little more later. This in between where you have some sort of long range features like this which you can see it's called a liquid phase or liquid region. And here things are completely ordered close to these corners here and this is what we call a solid region. So what I will be particularly interested in here today and which is a feature that you have in this two periodic diamond is that you have this sort of liquid gas interface somehow. So there, is, there seems to be some kind of boundary here between this liquid region and this gas region here. No. When you take A to 1 here, this, this region here will gradually disappear. Right? If you take A to 0, you will sort of get like a square here with just gas and then solid. So, so this is sort of a model where you can study this boundary. This, this type of boundary between solid and liquid has been studied in many models. And it's known that here you get the so-called airy process defining this boundary here. And the airy point process, if you look sort of where these long lines here sort of cut a line like this. So we, I'm interested in the same features at this liquid gas boundary. So in order to study this, I want to sort of look at, at the height function. There's a height version of this model also. And you define sort of the height will be sitting on the faces then, like of these. Aztec diamond graph then, the graph for the diamond model. So I arbitrarily put height zero here. 
And then if I cross this type of, vert, dom, of dimer here with a white square to the right, I go up three. If, I, if there is no dimer there, then depending on whether I have a white square to the left or right, I go up or down by one. So here I go three to four because I had a white square to the left there. Here I have a white square to the right, so then I go down. Right? So you can see, and if I look at sort of every other, so here you had four, then I go three, and you have four again here, because I sort of went just down and then up again. But here I have a dimer, so here I go up to seven, but then I have a dimer again, but now sort of which will take me down again, because now the white square is to the left. So you go four to four. So if you look at every other, you see you go in steps of four. So this will come back later, that's why I am emphasizing. So here you have two, and jumping two squares, because you had one of these in between, have gone up from two to six. Right. And you say white square to the left, it means in the dual axis, right? In the white vertex, or no? This, sort of, sorry, say again. The white square, when you say white square to the white, left. White, I'm not, not white square, I mean the white vertex, I mean, sorry. Yeah. No, it, it's depending on, on the, the, the color of, of the vertex that you have for this dimer. The dimer always connects a white and a black, right? And, de and when you cross it, depending on whether this is to the right or to the left, you go up and down or down. So we will be looking at sort of along a line like this and following two, two, six, two, for example. This is the type of height pattern that we will be interested in. I, I've drawn this here also because I want to come back to this later when we become a little more technical. So, so there is sort of a, if you have this type of, of height function, you can recover also the, the, the dimer and so on. So it's another way of looking at it. So in a simulation, it looks something like this. So what you saw is the gas region here. This will, this will be, you can imagine that there should be a kind of limiting surface here, a limit shape. And this will have sort of a flat, completely like facets here on, in this solid region. The gas part will also be flat, but not completely flat. There are some small dislocations there. And this liquid region will be kind of a curved surface here. And if you, you saw in the previous picture, oh sorry, no, I'm going in the wrong direction. In the previous picture, you saw that you have these sort of long range structures here. It's not so completely clear what they are when you start to look at it, but you, you can clearly see them at least, and they will be sort of be, be associated with the sort of long range changes in the height. If you look locally, you will also go up and down here because you have these small features, right? So, so you have this sort of small bumpy landscape, but now and then there come these long range things. So you also, again, you only go up one, <clears throat> sorry, one, one step, but you have one step that sort of stretches along a, a long way. So there's a difference between these sort of small scale things <clears throat> and the long range features. So this, this, it's a little hard to see this in the picture here, but if you would have this a little clearer and see, you can see that you have these long range structures associated with sort of height changes, and you have these small scale things. It's, you can see maybe here in the gas phase, you can see that there is this sort of small bumps here. Right? And you can also see that it's not so easy, perhaps, to see exactly where this boundary is. It's actually clearer here, where because you go from completely flat to seeing the first dislocation, so to say. So how, do we, how can we analyze this type of model? Well, to analyze Daimler models goes back, in, essentially, to Castellane in the early 60s. So there's something called the Castellane approach and the Castellane matrix. So I will be a little brief here, but this is sort of the tool that we're using here now. So you have the weight, for every edge we have this weight, right? And then you also choose something called a Castellan sign here for each edge. So this is a number, could be a plus minus one or the imaginary unit or something like that. So it's, it's a complex number with absolute value one. This ha has to have, this sign has to have certain properties for the theory to work, which I will not discuss now. But you then give a sort of assigned adjacency matrix here, so, which is this Castellay matrix. So you take the weight, the black vertex is connected with some 
white vertex, right? This has a certain weight if they are neighbors, otherwise this weight is zero, right? And you have this sign. So for the Aztec diamond, the following choice works. So this is something, of course, there's some theory behind now which I'm not explaining, right? So if you have a horizontal weight, these are these edges going in this direction. This is horizontal, this is vertical, right? Then you just take the weight. But if it's vertical, you multiply by an i. And if they are not near as neighbors, you just have a zero weight. Right? Because you have to, di dimers only cover nearest neighbor. Sorry. So this, this matrix is called a Castellane matrix. Then. So there are other possible ways of choosing these signs. So it's not unique. So if we have them, then there is the basic theorem in the Castellane approach says that C, the partition function. So for each dimer cover, I said you take the, you multiply the weights of all the dimers covering, right? And then you can sum over all the possible configuration. This is what you normalize with, right? This is called the partition function, capital Z here, right? And then this capital Z is actually given up to a sign here. It's given by the determinant of this Castellane matrix. So if I didn't have this sign, factor, I would have the permanent here instead. But the permanent is not a very nice object to work with. It's better to have a determinant. And this sign factor that we had makes this into a determinant. So this S will not depend on the weights. It only depends on these signs that we chose. OK, so based on this, you can prove rather easily that the probability of C certain edges, say E1 to EM, being covered by dimers is given by a determinant also. So you have to invert the Castellane matrix. I mean, we, there should be at least one dimer cover. So this, this, this C here is non-zero, right? So you can invert the matrix and you multiply also by this, this element in the Castellane matrix. So this determinant then gives the probability for this, if these EIs, they, they, they are, go from black vertex I to white vertex I here, say. So this means that the, that the dimers form a de determinantal point process, right? You can see these as particles in a determinantal point process, because so if I let this kernel for the edges, so to say, E, I, E, J, be this object here, then the probability of seeing certain dimers is a determinant with this kernel. This you recognize as the definition of a determina discrete determinantal process. Right? So the dimers form a determinantal process, and we can get the kernel for this process, which is what we need in order to analyze it, right, by inverting this Castellane matrix, right, which in general, of course, is a very difficult task, I mean, to invert a large matrix, yes. So the, the I factor out, so that you want to keep them in the determinant? This, you mean, this thing here. So the, the, in your determinant, you have the, the first term depends only on I, so it factors out. Yeah, this you could factor out, but you want to sort of put this whole object okay. Yeah, because you want to have this whole object as the kernel somehow, yeah. Okay, so th this is sort of the way we, we can approach this problem, provided, of course, then we can actually compute this inverse. Right? So l let me be a little more precise about these faces so that you see the difference between them. So in the limit, you will have these shapes. So the, these two, are, these are algebraic curves. There are two real components of a degree eight algebraic curve, which you can compute explicitly. And divide sort of the, in the limit, you get these three, these three types of regions, then, as you saw in the picture, which I call that just names, gas, liquid, solid. So this, the fact that you have these three types of faces, this is sort of known to be in this class of models. These are the type of limiting Gibbs translation invariant Gibbs measures that you can get. So, 
So there are three types, and they are called now, there are other possible names also, but I will use these names, solid, liquid, and gas. And they can be described by sort of some limiting in, inverse Castle matrix, an infinite inverse matrix then. Of three types then. So there are different liquid phases and different gas phases, depending on what you come from, but they have a certain structure. And these, these have explicit formulas in terms of integrals. I mean, so you know what these, these how to describe the, these pure phases, so to say. So the difference more physically than, or probabilistically, between these phases is the following, right? But if you look at how, how the correlation between dimers decays, so you take dimers as the distance r, say, and if you're in a, in a gas phase and you let r increase, then the correlation will decay exponentially, like e to the, some constant times, e to the minus some positive constant times r, right? So, so it means that in the gas phase, you have a fast decay of correlations. In the, in the solid phase, you have sort of deterministic correlations, right? It's a rigid pattern. Right? Whereas in the liquid phase, you sort of have long-range correlations, so it decays polynomially, typically like one over the distance squared. So, and this is sort of what you see in these long-range features. There are strong correlations in, in, in the liquid phase. So this sort of characterizes the different types of phases that you can see. So, as I said, what I'm interested in is this liquid gas boundary, which is sort of the new feature that you can analyze in this model. Then. So we'll want to look somewhere here, in, in this picture here, and ask ourselves, what, what can we say about the sort of behavior at, at, at around this boundary? Then? Can we sort of see the boundary and how does it behave? So what are the edge fluctuations? So there seems to be some kind of edge here. I mean, the limit there is a well-defined curve here, but actually if you start to think and look microscopically, it's not so clear. You can see here, I mean, there are, where exactly is the boundary? I mean, there are clumps here, right? I mean, so how do you actually microscopically see the boundary? I mean, so, so at, at this sort of liquid solid boundary here, it's actually quite clear. There is a kind of limit, first curve here where things change. Right? Here one could certainly prove that this is the airy process that you're seeing, as we see in man, many other models also. But here, along this boundary, or if we look here, it's much less clear how to actually, what is this boundary? I mean, asymptotically, it's clear where it is. But microscopically, say that I'm looking around myself, am I seeing one of these long structures, or, or am, am I just seeing some shorter range feature? Right? This is not so clear. Yes, I mean, it is clear. I mean, it will be like the n to the one third that you would expect, yes. And you will see that sort of coming out in formulas later also. So, so th this is sort of the problem we, we want to address. I mean, how do you actually see this kind of boundary effect here? Right? Is there, again, an airy process in some sense there? It's sort of a natural conjecture. I mean, we think that this error process in this kind of mode should be associated with going from a flat interface to this curved, in terms of the height model. From going from flat to a curved thing, you should, at the boundary there, you should see these area process fluctuations. Right? Here it's again from a, this curved liquid phase into this asymptotically flat gas phase, but of course it's not perfectly flat, but it's a natural conjecture to think that, okay, again, you have some kind of airy behavior there. So, as you saw in the Castellane approach, we need the inverse Castellane matrix. And it's in this model, you can actually compute a useful formula for this, which is sort of remarkable. I will not at all discuss this, it's a long, argument to get this formula, and probably uh, not so natural argument, but there is a formula in a way. So you, you, this is, so you have with this graph, right, there is some coordinate system associated with this graph that you use in the formulas here. Right? So a, a dimer would go between certain coordinates in this way, right? So this would go from 3, 3, I mean, to some other point, right? So I'm just putting this up now. It's not, you, you don't have to absorb these formulas. This is not the point here now. 
So the point is that there is a formula here now for this inverse Castellan matrix, right? Which is what comes into this determinantal process of the, of the diamond, right? So it has one part is sort of a gas part. This is just the infinite plane gas inverse Castellan matrix, right? So this has an explicit integral formula. Then there are four other parts, and these four parts all look like this. This is the first one. So it's given by a double contour integral. It has a sort of a standard form if you recognize this type of kernels, right? It does, it's not rational functions. You have some square root and things, but it is an explicit formula. There are complicated parts here which I've avoided writing down, but, it's, but they are just local things, not asymptotic. So the, point, the only point of this slide is to say that there is a formula. It is of a form that you can analyze asymptotically by steepest descent methods. Right? So of course, in order to do that, you have to start looking at the details here. But it, from these formulas that are on the, on the screen now, you could quite easily get this degree 8 curve, for example. This follows quite straightforwardly from these things. But there is this formula. So we needn't worry about the detail. So is it clear that A equal 1 or C equal a half makes a difference when you look at this formula? Yes, it is clear. But actually, to take A equal to 1 is this formula and get back the uniform master is not clear at all. It's not, it's actually, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. And this is because there are sort of technical reasons for this somehow, which I won't explain now. But it actually, it's sort of a kind of singular limit from this point. It's actually even if you look at these formulas for a standard Aztec diamond where you have different weights for horizontal and vertical, taking A to 1 in the formulas, you have to deform the contours appropriately and so on. So, I mean, it's, this is not... And if from the sort of algebraic geometry point of view, you can understand it because, as you were asking, when you take A equal to 1, this gas region shrinks. So it's sort of a singular situation. So. A, yeah, in, it's not re, it's critical in the sense that just, just when the gas phase appears and it shows up in the formulas that it's actually not obvious to take this limit. But for A equal to 1, we know everything, right? So we really want to have something like A equal to a half here. Now. So what the limiting object then, what, what is this then? Well, the limiting object what I'm interested in is sort of the area kernel point process. So th this is... You know, this is what I draw a little here. You, the area kernel point process, you have a certain number of lines like this. And you have, you have particles on this line. There will be some last particles here. The last particle have tracy widdom fluctuations here. This is a determinantal point process living on these, on these lines. Right? I can choose any number of lines I want. I think of this as a random measure. So it's an integer valued measure. The number of points in an interval is an integer, right? I call this random measure mu area here. So one way of describing such a measure is to give its Laplace transform. So I take one of these lines, beta 2, for example, and I take some interval here, AP, and I count the number of points in this interval, right? I do this for many intervals. I take some complex numbers here and I form this Laplace transform of these numbers. Right? Then it's a theory of determinantal point processes then say that this Laplace transform is given by a de Fredholm determinant. Right? Where this function captures the indicator function for these intervals. Right? And these are the complex weights. And the kernel here is what defines the process then. In this case, it is this extended airy kernel. Right? Is points are interlacing or not? No, they are not necessarily interlacing, no. There is no sort of, I mean, in principle, you should think that what you see, for example, if you looked at Dyson Brown motion and limit, you have these curves, right? In principle, you can imagine connecting these with curves like this. So there is no interlacing between these. Okay. So this, is, this is just the same as the curve. Problem. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, you, you take, if you would take sort of Dyson Brown in motion, intersect it within at certain times and look at in the limit at the boundary, you would get this process. And the kernel that you put into this Fredholm determinant here has two parts. This is, this is just a Gaussian factor. And then you have this airy part here, which is given by this integral here. So this is a typical form that you see in these extended kernels in, in random matrix theory and, and in discrete models. So th this, is, this, this point process here we know very well. I mean, it's completely described in principle by this thing. So this is the limiting object that we somehow would like to get out of the pictures that we've seen. Right? So how, how can you get this, this limit out of what I've shown you? This is sort of the problem I'm addressing here. Right? So let's look at the height again. So the height is change is sort of due to these long range features, except that you also, as I said, have these sort of more local up and down effects. Right? So you have sort of small and basically independent height fluctuation due to sort of, if you're at the boundary here, what you're actually, you're sort of having, you're sort of really seeing a gas phase at the boundary, right? Because as Gerard was asking, I mean, the distance between these lines is like n to the one third, and we're looking at the size of the Aztec diamond, and this goes to infinity, right? So, so now and then, if you're standing there, you would see one of these lines, but mostly you would be standing in this gas phase. But the, the correlations in the gas phase decay exponentially, as I said. So, and this leads to having sort of base, I mean, the height fluctuations due to the, this gas phase are very local, right? So somehow you have to separate these local fluctuations from these long range effects, right? That you sort of see in the picture, but we have to capture it somehow. So this is what I'm saying, long distance correlated effects due to large scale structures that we see in the figure, this is sort of also causes height differences, right? So the idea now is to construct a random measure that should converge to this random measure for the area point process using height differences, which capture these long range correlations, right? So what, what you do then, what we want to do is to take something like this, that we take some intervals in this picture, right? And we take height differences along these, right? You take these sufficiently far apart so that the height change here in terms of these local variations are basically independent. So when you take the average height difference over these, it would capture these sort of long lines, right? Because they cut through many of them. They are long range structures. So the height change in this first interval is sort of due to two effects. The fact that it's crossed by these two long range things and many sort of local height changes here also, but they would be sort of independent here, right? And sort of cancel out. So this is, we want to take some average like this. So now I will describe this idea a little more technically now. Yes, I haven't, this, yeah, I haven't exactly looked, that's a good question, and this is something I meant to look into. It should, it should sort of change the, 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 the constant that you have there, but exactly how to look at it, I have not done that yet. But now we're, we're really in the gas phase now in some sense. I mean, although saying something like this means that I'm sort of separating, I'm saying I have the gas phase plus something else. This is not really true, I mean. But, but this is sort of the idea. Right? So instead of taking many intervals, that, as I described here, let's consider just one interval. Right? So we, this is just that because the formulas work only in this case. We only have the formulas for when the size is 4m. So m you should think of now as the size of the Aztec diamond, small m here. So we, we take an interval and we want to embed a certain number, this works, of copies of these into the Aztec diamond in the, at the liquid gas interface. Then. 
a certain distance apart. These are the ones that I drew there. So, so I want to put sort of some, some discrete points. So recall now from what I said earlier that the heights are sitting on these faces here, right? And the dimers cover like this. So the position of the dimers you can think of as points like these. So th these are called sort of, these are sort of discrete points sitting here. So this, this just, S here is just an integer. This just, it's just a parametrization sort of of these points, right? And these things, these numbers here are just so that I've placed myself exactly at the liquid gas boundary somehow. So when I vary S here, I'm moving along the liquid gas boundary. So these blue points here, you can think they just continue indefinitely well, both directions. These are these which I call the sort of discrete lines. So this is where my sort of dimer process is sitting on these points. So this is sort of the space where my determinantal process is sitting. Right? So LM is the union of all of these that I'm looking at. Right? So, so, so that will be the space that I'm looking at. Right? So the details are not, so this is just to get one third there is this, the right scale to look at in this direction, because the distances here are like of this size, right? This two-thirds, this is both the correlations in this direction is of order, the size of the Aztec diamond to the power two-thirds. So this beta here is one of these beta, betas that you see here. So this just parametrizes what I'm interested in. So we have this interval then. I, I, I embed this interval as a sort of discrete interval. This is, the, oh, sorry. These are these things that I drew here also. With a certain distance apart, right? So, so AL and AR here, they, they were the endpoints of the interval here, right? So I have something of size of the Aztec diamond to the power one third that I embed. So, so this discrete interval is some part along these lines here. Lambda 1 is just some appropriate constant right, to get the limit in the good form. And I take a certain number, capital M, of these. So the distance is like log M, log the size of the Aztec diamond squared here. And this is sufficiently far apart to them to be relatively uncorrelated in terms of the gas picture, the gas phase. So now I take two faces here now, and look at the height difference. So this is a certain discrete interval. This could be, now it's very short, it's much longer, of course. But this is sort of one of these discrete intervals where I sort of embedded this interval that corresponds to the A, right? And then I look at the difference between the heights of these two faces. This is what I've drawn here. And this is a multiple of four, as I indicated earlier, right? So what I do is that I sum over, all, over these Line, parallel lines here. I sum the height differences and I take the average. And I divide by four because they were just multiples of four. Right? So this is now a random measure. Depending on the dimer configuration I have, I will get different values here, right? This is not a point process now, right? Because, I'm, because of the average, then there is no reason for this to be an integer. But my hope is that this should actually converge now to the area point process that I, we have in the limit. Right? So the, and the argument that I give is sort of, a, I try to make it reasonable that this should be true. Right? This is, in a sense, this should capture these long lines here in the limit. And actually, this is the theorem, that, that this random measure converges to this area point process. Right? In, as the size of the Aztec diamond increases here. So let's address this question now at, at the end a little technically. We want to, if we just have one interval, we want to prove that the Laplace transform of this measure for one interval converges to the corresponding thing for the air limiting thing. This is what we want to do. 
And this is one of these squares that we have here now, right? So there could be a dimer covering here or covering there, right? So these are points, these discrete points that we had in these discrete lines, right? So they could be covered or not covered by a dimer. There is a parity here. Remember, we could go both up and down depending on whether we, when, when we had a dime, right? We could have plus sort of or, or minus, right? So there is a parity associated with this. So this is, creates a difficulty in the analysis, but it is, of course, crucial, right? So if I have a dimer here, I go up. So this has, I put this parity zero there. If I have a dimer here, I will go down. So I put a one there. And then I say that I have a particle in my process, if there is a dimer here, say. Then I have a particle at this point, if a dimer covers this. So this means that these particles now, which lives on this discrete line then, they have a certain correlation kernel given by this inverse cast lane, and this is, came from this prefactor that we have, right? the cast lane matrix. So we have, in principle, we have this, this, we know this, right? In these forms of these double integrals, at least. So then, how do I capture the height difference? Well, let's, I, K, be the indicator for some discrete interval then, whether, I, whether I'm in this interval or not. So then I take all these particles, dimers, right? We're sitting on these CIs, these blue points here, right? I count them with a sign, because I could go up or down in height, right? And I sum over all particles. Then I get this height difference. So it's not just a counting statistic, sort of a difference of counting statistics depending on parity, right? And then, of course, I put this into the sort of the determinantal framework now. So I have this, this sort of linear statistic. So if I put this in, this is sort of the function. I have, at a point, I take whether I'm in the interval or not, and I take a sign, right? I sum over all possibilities. So this is sort of the Laplace transform. Oh, there should be a W here, sorry. Yeah, the W should have been put here. But then, again, by, since it's a determinantal point process, I get this Fredholm determinant. But this. For those of you who have worked with this, you know, we have this Fredholm Depurna, we want to take this scaling limit to see the airy process or whatever, or some sine kernel process. You take some scaling limit of the kernel, right? And you, in the limit, you get this, what you want, right? But this is, you cannot really do that here, because this sign, it won't be, you can't, it's not just taking a limit of this, this won't give you anything, because the, because the dominant thing here is this gas thing. And this gas thing has to somehow cancel out. And this is due to these sign things here, of course. So you cannot just sort of take some scaling limit of a kernel here. You have to look at this whole thing. Five minutes. Four minutes. Five. I will be finished. So what we use is that we, we take this and we look at the cumulant expansion here. So there is a well-known cumulant expansion for a determinant like this. So we want to compute these traces here. And now, we, of course, we have to put in some asymptotics in the for, into the formula. So we have to have some asymptotic formula for this inverse Castellane matrix to put into this. Right? So what does that look like? Well, we zoom in here. right? And in, in the, this direction, sort of, orthogonal to, the, to this interface. This is the one, one direction. The scaling is like the size of the Aztec diamond one third. This is the scaling exponent. In the, in the transversal direction, parallel here, you have the power two third instead, right? So this is going in this direction. So I introduce new scaled variables, psi one, tau one, psi two, tau two. So this is, would be a white vertex, this would be a black vertex. If you put this into the formulas that we had, I mean, which you saw briefly, and do an asymptotic analysis, what you comes out is that you, of course, you have still have this gas part, right? Then this 
part of the extended area kernel emerges. Right? But this is much smaller than the gas part. This is of order one. Right? This is of order one over m to the one third. So this sort of is very small compared to this one. Then there is a prefactor here also, which is rather complicated and I've not written down. So this is what we have to put in. So I, go, I have this formula now. I put it in here, and then you have to work. And this is the lot of technical work that I will not show you. I won't be that technical. But, but you, see, you can see one thing, two things. Let me observe two things here. But since this is smaller, this reflects that the fact that the dominant thing is this gas phase. But every now and then, this will have an effect. And this corresponds to this long-range structure. But of course, in this cumulant here, in this trace, and this whole expression here, the effect of this has to cancel out somehow. So in the end, you end up with this part. And this is a rather delicate, subtle cancellation that you have to figure out in this formula. So this is a sort of one important feature. But you can see. Yeah. I'm not sure. So here you, these asymptotics are really valid only at the liquid. Yeah, this, yeah, transition, yeah. But I understand the result is also there only, or I thought it was in the whole phase? In the whole phase? No, no, the, the, we only computed asymptotics at this liquid. Yeah, you could compute them at other points also, but we haven't done. You could do it at the liquid solid, for example. Also. No, this we've done also. You have two eerie type things at the two boundaries. Yes. And in the middle, yeah, that would, it would look, you just look like any liquid kind of phase, yeah. You could compute that, at least at certain parts of the diagram. But recall now, so this is the last thing. Recall now that, which shows that you cannot, you cannot really, you know, you cannot add kernels, right, in a determinantal process. It doesn't really make sense, right? So I'm saying all the time we have the gas phase plus these things. So this is, of course, not really true, and this is actually something which confused us for a while here with these formulas. Because if you remember, we had this extended area. It's actually this Gaussian part, right, plus this K tilde part that, which came from the area. Right? So this has to be, this is crucial. This is what gives the local Brownian behavior of these parts. This has to be there. So where does this come from, right? It has to come from this, right? So when you take out this prefactor here, because you just want this, but you have the prefactor inverse of this prefactor times this. This in the limit is what gives the Gaussian thing. So which is, we found this, the gas is some, doesn't have anything to do with this path somehow. But, but it shows that this, this, you have to think of this as a whole expression. That you cannot really separate these parts. But doing this and putting everything in, you can actually prove this limit, that this random measure which I defined here actually does convert to the, this, this area point process. But in this argument, which I skipped now, it's a complicated thing to work with these cumulants. But once you have the ID, you can sort of force that through. I mean, it works. I mean, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you.